Linwood, Linwood right out St. Gentleman once, I believe, was talking to us and saying that when the power company would come along and get rid of, put new poles up, mm -hmm. all the carvers would go out and harvest the old creosote. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, and they were the best, and they were great for, these, for this purpose. And that, so I wonder if that was a widespread practice, but also what were the materials that were typically used? Was it cedar? Everything? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the wood used or the materials used also depended on where they were being made. Decoys in Louisiana used, you know, Tupelo and Cypress and, and the woods that they had down there. Uh, here, most of the bodies were cedar because cedar's naturally rot resistant. Um, and it was in pretty large supply then. It's getting harder to find. Big cedar. Um, pine heads normally because there's a lot more detailed carving in the, in the mandibles and the eyes. And, um, and it was a little easier to carve. And it didn't matter that it, was, you know, that it wasn't rot resistant naturally because it wasn't sitting in the water. After around and after World War II, there was this huge supply of, of cork from the life rafts uh, coming back from the war effort cork decoys all of a sudden, you know, became very popular uh, because it was free material or very cheap material. Uh, then with the synthetics, you know, the paper mache, there were actually paper mache decoys, which is strange because they were sitting in water. Um, rubber decoys, plastics now. Um, what does that mean? This one, I'd, I'd say probably cedar or pine. You see a lot of times at a decoy auction, you'll see people smelling the decoys. It's is that the inlaid head you were speaking of? Yep, yep. And that's and very... What the, what's the date in terms of... Uh, right, 1930, 1935. And the cracks don't harm it too much? Uh, I mean, it does, but not... I mean, not terribly. Um, and that's what you were talking about, about the head, head tilting and... Yeah, he would do all kinds of... This one, uh, he did it a little different than he normally would have. He, he um, you know, used two separate... Uh, um, normally the head and the neck seat would have been all one piece of wood. And it sort of makes you look twice to see whether, you know, at some point the head didn't crack off and they didn't just add a, this new piece. Um, but and an X-ray would tell us for 100 percent, but the paint all matches, um, so it's it's original. So he carved. I'm trying to think how he would have done that. Carved the head and neck, but then decided to make it a turned head. Uh, cut it there, turned the head, and finished carving it. Did you have an X-ray machine in the house? Or you Not in house. I've been. I'm thinking about talk, trying to talk them into getting one from a out of business dentist or something because we. I don't do it, our shipping manager does, but he'll, uh, if we have questions about any of the bills or any, because we, it's totally unique in the auction business since 1984, we've guaranteed everything we've ever sold to be as described. And we've given people's money back on $130,000 items because, you know, we, we didn't disclose that, it, you know, it had a bill repair because the bill repair was that good. We didn't think twice about getting it x-rayed. Uh, but for the most part on the high price stuff, we, if there's any question, we get it x-rayed. And that'll show us um, different wood. You can see it splice. You can easily see uh, if, say, if um, there are no sharp marks here, but you get it x-rayed and you see a bunch of little holes, obviously they've been filled and it's been repainted, so that affects the value. And, um, and uh, a lot of times with the paint especially, I mean, I could handle... 10 decoys, five of which are original, five that are repainted. I can do it blindfolded and probably pick them out correctly 95% of the time just just because of the feel of the paint. Um, the old paint is dry and almost hard feeling, whereas the new paint is very soft and slick. Um, Some early plastic uh, fishing lures. Mm -hmm. like drawing a hundred or hundreds of dollars. Yep. Do you see any tendency like that in plastic decoys or early plastic? Uh, I'm gonna say probably not. I think the fishing collectibles, there's just a lot more people buying them. So that's pushing the prices up a little higher. The the plastic decoys, I think, you know, the the even cork decoys um, you know have a certain ceiling. 
just because there's a certain ceiling in the amount of people buying them at that real high prices. Um, How about the paper mache? Even paper mache. I mean, they tell a story and they're historically important for the timeline of the decoys, but you know, anything that was really mass produced like that other than the Mason factory, um, you know, like even George Sewell L.L. Bean, you know, hundreds of thousands of decoys out there that, you know, the supply and demand, basically. Um, and with the fish, yeah, with fishing stuff, I think there's, you know, I, I'd buy fishing stuff. I'm just about anybody who's ever been fishing, I can see getting into it, whereas hunting, you know, the decoys, not everybody that collects decoys is a hunter, but I think a lot of people think they almost have to be a hunter to collect decoys, but definitely not the case. Um, have you ever seen a, uh, a gannet decoy? Uh, no, there's certain, I mean, certain uh, species are just, there were never any made. Actually, I forgot to talk about that. Confidence decoys, um, like with herons, uh, and cranes, they did actually hunt them for the feathers, but uh, normally when we see a heron decoy, it was used as a confidence decoy. So uh, if you had 80 um, black duck decoys and you were hunting black ducks, you might still bring a loon decoy or a swan decoy or a heron decoy, but just one, and you'd set it off you know, to the side of your spread, and that would make your spread look even that much more real because those birds are real solitary birds and don't like to, you know, they're very skittish of humans, so um, it would make it seem a lot more safe than it was. That's why, you know, there are very few of those confidence decoys and they bring in lots and lots of money, especially the early gunning swans um, and the early herons yeah. and terns, stuff. You know, the rare species, that, uh, the rare species are, are definitely harder to find and worth more. Loon decoys, uh, for the real, uh, high-end collector. Most of them are collecting the best examples by the best carvers from around the country. But a lot of them like to own one loon or one heron or one swan because they're important to the whole, you know, they sort of accompany their decoy spread that they have on the wall. Um, and lo main, main loons um, for the good ones can, they're very, very rare, so they can bring a lot, a lot of money. Willie Eastman was from um, Harpswell, I think, Ors Island, uh, and his hollow loons. I think there's only two or three known, but they're 75, 80,000. Yeah. A couple more decoys. Yeah, the rest of the, these are all part of the historical society. Too. Oh, okay. Then would ride out, collect them, and what he was supposedly doing was getting one from the duck hunting stuff of each of his friends. Yep. It's probably why there's so many black ducks. I know black ducks really yeah. in the bay. That's pretty much the bird we're hunting. Um, I would say that this is a, it's a, a, some, a hunter made copy of a Stevens Brother decoy. Weed Sport New York, Stevens Brothers. They were a factory factory. They, I mean, they, it was basically him and his brother, but they did have some people helping them. Um, they were a very early factory. They were the first factory, quote unquote, um, like 1880s. This one would have been somebody who had one or had seen one and carved it very, very similar to theirs. Um, it's in a real early second coat, but not, you know, not the original coat of paint probably repainted 80 years ago. That's the same company as that pintail, sorry, Down East Decoy Factory. This one's a solid body one, not hollow, and it's a black duck. Um, that same swimming pose, where is it? Over there, yeah. Uh, that same raised, raised wingtip. <coughs> For the most part, for, with the down east, you can see they did the tails different to represent the species, but that was about it. The rest of the bodies were basically done the same. The heads were basically done the same. Um, this one's got the stamp or the remnants of it. Um, 
you can, these are, I mean, the, you find them fairly easily. Uh, you know, that's a pretty rare example with the hollow pintail in excellent condition, 400. Uh, this one, black duck, solid body in this condition, um, 100. What about the value of this one? That one, uh, if it was an original paint, Stevens Brothers, uh, carved in 1880s, uh, it, it'd be, we've sold them for eight, 9,000. This one, Hunter made uh, copy, probably, I mean, it's still early, it's probably from the 30s, um, but second coat of paint, uh, somewhere and stuff, um, 200. I've seen this maker before, but um, hollow carved black duck. It's got some pretty much all original. There's definitely some touch up in here, but um, and you know it's to a, to a collector, you know it's you're sort of decorating your house. Uh, and you want to look at something that's interesting with flowing lines and, and black ducks are sort of hard to do that. Some carvers would have looping paint and definitely, you know, usually speculums, green or blue. Um, this one's sort of all black. So visually it's not too exciting, but historically it's, you know, it's got importance. Um, I guess you can say that that's who made it. Um, so hollow carved, original paint, black duck. Um, Four hundred. That was made by Livewood, I believe. Yep. That's you know that's how he saw the black duck, or that was his. Sort of is his that probably a, a telephone pole or something like that? A, a big chunk of wood. Yeah, or he just uh, just figured this was good enough. I mean, a, a decoy is going to sit pretty low in the water anyway, so you know most of it wouldn't even have been seen by the birds. Um, it's likely he just didn't take the time or didn't think it was necessary to carve it as smooth or as rounded. Um, but it's an original paint, worn original paint. Um, uh, and again, you know, the historical importance for around here is a lot more significant than, say, to a collector from Massachusetts or something. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I found it interesting. Look at these two. I mean, this yeah. is supposedly from a different person. But no, it's the same maker for sure. I would say. And a lot of times, I mean, we we get we do free appraisals so we get hundreds and hundreds of emails and you know somebody says this is a decoy carved by my grandfather and you know the whole story but it, it you know it's a mason decoy um so sometimes throughout the years it's tough to you know to you sort of just record what you hear but um and i don't doubt these are 100 percent by the same maker and they actually make a really neat pair because one's preening one's straight head one's got glass eyes one doesn't have any eyes but still a pair um, I mean, just the way the, the back is shaped. Yeah, I mean, 100% the weights. They're rigged the same way. The square tails, um, the bill carving. The eyes were likely added later in this one. Or he just happened to have, maybe he pulled the eyes off a doll or something of his daughter. Most decoy makers use imported German glass eyes. Uh, so as a pair, I mean, they're a lot more appealing now with the preener. Um, for the pair, 750. Does the price of the pair, is that more than like two added up? It, it, not two equally, no. Uh, I mean, and really, I it sold separately, I wouldn't, the two separately wouldn't add up to 750. Yeah. The single one straight head would be like 75 or 100, and the preener would be 300 probably. What time frame is that? I'd say, 40s or 50s. We don't know anything about that one. 
it's sort of you know a chip carved black duck. Um, sometimes you know the person just didn't have the right tools, uh, so this guy had, definitely had a hatchet. Probably didn't have a spoke shave or didn't see the need to use them. Um, the head's been broken off at some point, but reattached with some nails. They actually maybe even tried to carve the whole head and neck and everything is one piece of wood is what it looked like which would have made a really weak point there and they would have nailed it back in with later round nails um, and it's definitely hard to date ones like that um, but I'd say from 50s or 60s uh, and value 50 or 60. I'm glad to see decoys. Zach, thank you. I think that's all the ones I picked. We picked up this large one. Yep. And there's another one in the top of the bag that we picked up the same person. And um, they had written on the bottom, and we're not sure if what was written was accurate or if that was mm -hmm. just wishful thinking. Um, I mean, it's very similar. I'd say the body is a Doug Jester. The paint style and stuff is essentially the same as his. Uh, I mean, he didn't, Doug Jester didn't write that. Um, actually, I think I might have seen the decoy without the writing at some point, but um, this, this, the seam here is uh, probably where this piece was added to a a decoy that had lost its head, but very much in the style. I mean, that's Doug Jester carving, so it possibly was possibly was repaired by Just Jester himself. Somebody. Br a lot of times, the decoys would have been brought back to the same person to have repainted or or repaired. So it's possible that it was repaired by the same person. Um, Doug Jester McGanzer. We just sold one, a mint one, for three thousand. Uh, this one's pretty worn, original paint uh, with the question of the head, a little chip here, but you know, still a really neat decoy. Um, probably 650, 700, something like that. Large one. Large one. Whitney family. That's what we did, and then somebody wrote in pencil. I think you must have seen it. I've seen this one too, yeah. Okay. And the pencil writing is typical. Wish yeah. The pencil writing is typical of the, the salesman, but uh, definitely Whitney family, but early Whitney family, really neat. Uh, most of his geese are sort of hard to look at, gaudy paint and real bright colors. This one's, you know, real muted and uh, much earlier. Um, yeah, but I mean, with a decoy this size, when you grab hold of the neck, <laughs> it would have definitely pulled it off. And it's got some filler in the body and stuff. I mean, it appears to be all original paint. Uh, the, you know, the split in the underside and stuff doesn't have paint in it. So that's a lot of times if you see shot marks or cracks with paint in it, that means it was painted after it split or after it was shot at. Is that so. built up with several pieces of wood? This looks like it's one giant piece of wood. Oh. So that's why, you know, I say early. Whitney's carved up into the late 70s, I think. Um, this is a J-A, so this is James Whitney. Uh, um, it's probably from the 30s, because, I mean, you can't find wood. I mean, you can, but it's tough to find wood this big. And the split, it, I mean, oh, yeah. any decoy this size would have been guaranteed to have a split like that, because carvers today say, uh, for a piece of wood, you're supposed to let it dry a year for every inch of thickness. So this would have, you know, after it was harvested, would have taken 15 years before you wanted to use it as a decoy. I have uh, no problem with live wooden bowls. So yeah. Things, the big They'll crack. Yep. Um, and, I mean, there are a few of these early ones, you know, around. Uh, there's a guy that's buying everything Whitney right now. Um, I 
Um, it's tough to tough to put a value. Uh, it's interesting. The head's almost the same as this black duck right here. Can I see? Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. The um, the other one. And it could have been somebody that carved in the style of, or it could have been somebody that said, can you carve me a head for this body that I carved? <laughs> and you can see yeah, a little hook in the, build. the mandible. Uh, I don't want to draw either one of these, but from the top, you can see. And even the, yeah. like the profile of the face and head. You know, no painted eyes on this one, painted eyes on that one. And he, he sort of made the flow in the underside of the mandible. This one doesn't have it quite as much. Um, but so it's possible this person had one of his decoys and said, how do I carve a mandible on a, you know, on a black duck? And sort of used this as an example. Because the Whitney's carved black ducks, mostly black ducks, mostly for use here. Um, Could that be a Whitney? I don't think so. Uh, they didn't do hollow carved, flat bottom, and they branded everything they owned. They branded their shovels, they branded <laughs> everything. Guns, boats. Uh, the goose, I'd say, a couple thousand, probably. Two, two three, yeah, two, two, yeah. Yep, and the, oh, there's another one there. Mason Decoy Factory, standard grade. Glass eyes, repainted. Um, it was likely a black duck or a mallard beforehand. You can see it's a slightly shorter bill than this one, but uh, weighted, similar but different. You know, because they sold them without any line ties or weights. Uh, conditions everything with masons, but people do restore them. Um, Somebody who bought this would take the paint down and restore it with the with the mason paint, but in this condition, ninety dollars. And a main scoter, inlaid head, early repaint. Too bad it wasn't about the size and had loon paint on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, unknown maker, Scoter, um, but neat, early, uh, 250, 225, something like that. Yep. And those are prices, you know, those, all the prices I'm saying, that's not necessarily auction value, but that's, you know, insurance or sitting in a shop type thing. You know, auctions have been getting, you know, it's, although we're online, you can bid online, you can bid by phone, you can bid, you know, absentee, it would make it very, very easy to bid at auction. Um, it's still sort of, you know, if, if there's an election the day before, or if there's, you know, a hurricane a week before, it can have an effect on an auction. You, you have... Can you preview them in your Freeport store? No, the Freeport store is essentially in 2003, four, or five. I mean, the prices were getting so high, and we were getting so much press that everybody wanted to sell their decoys. Uh, and our auctions were, you know, a thousand, eleven hundred, twelve hundred items in an auction, and it was just too much. So we we took items in the seven, six, seven hundred dollars and under range put them on the website, put them in a retail setting, because um, that's sort of the price point that's been softening the most. Um, so we set it at a set price, you know, you don't have the risk of the auction. Uh, and it's still co real collectible stuff, it's just the people who are gonna fly or drive to one of our auctions, you know, stay in a hotel room for three nights, uh, they're, they're not going there to buy a $400 item, they're going to buy a $4,000 item. Uh, and with online bidding and phone bidding and all this stuff, um, you know, it's, uh, and with the internet, I mean, we could have our shop anywhere in the world and we'd probably do the same amount of sales that we do now.
but with the Freeport location, it's exposure, getting people, you know, exposed to decoys and doing appraisals. I, I had a pair of mergansers walk in. Uh, the guy had actually used them with his kids hunting. I, he had five of them, two pairs and a single. I told him the two pairs were easily worth 60000 per pair. And he, he, was, he was floored. He was happy. Usually, usually they're consigned quickly thereafter, but no, he gave one pair to one son and one pair to another, which is great. Sounds like a joke. A pair of orgasms walking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do this, these look like some of those. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, they're. It's almost like it's an early prototype or something because they're very similar, but then still slightly different. Real flat bottom. Uh. But uh, I'd say definitely down east decoy factory. Um, sometimes after, especially because they're only in business for four years, uh, you know, it's possible that their patterns and their machines were sold at auction or sold to somebody or given to somebody, and possibly somebody tried to make, you know, some, um, but maybe plane down the underside flatter than the company actually did. But I'd say it's down east decoy black duck. Um, and you can see in some of the flakes, there's, you know, there's color underneath the flake, so it's likely a, more than one coat of paint. Um, but again, you know, important for this region because they were only in business for four years, so they only sold a certain amount of them. Uh, so probably in that hundred dollar range. Sorry, that's how I, <laughs> that's how I started collecting. Was I mean I don't have very many, but I started collecting with downies because they're, they're fun and local and. Bluebill, it's a bluebill of Drake. It's got glass eyes. It's probably a little later than it looks. It's got a coat of varnish on it, which protected the paint. It's good, good paint, but it's also darkened it a little bit, making it appear a little early, uh, later or earlier. Um, not sure exactly where it was made. There's no real characteristics that are typical of any one region. Um, possibly on Terrio. Uh, so unknown maker, sort of unknown region. Tough to put a price on. It's sort of decorative uh, value at that point. So, you know, probably still 125, 150. Sure just because it's original condition. I've got a, um, a question about the Alpha Hawk and Wallace surf scoter. Yep. Alton Wallace is from uh, his, it's the whole Wallace clan. They're from Smalls Point, Oars Island. Uh, his father created the West Point style boat and made a living making those boats. And Alton made them while he was still alive and he also carved decoys. Um, the Amos Wallaces, there's a lot of people that think Amos never carved anything, but then there are a lot of decoys we attribute to Amos just because they've always been attributed to Amos Wallace uh, and without any 100% proof that he never carved, we're just gonna keep selling him as Amos Wallace. Um, but Alton Wallace, you know, he carved A Wallace in the underside or branded. Uh, his earlier stuff is, is sought after carved late into his life, um, surf scoter, 100% original paint, six, seven hundred, if it's later, if it's earlier, 1500. Yeah, I think it's probably later. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. There's so many decoys out there, <laughs> so many carvers, so many species. That's why it's, you can actually collect them because you know, you can specialize in just mason decoys, but you can have 300 of them because there's so many different species, different grades. Um, they, they made shorebirds. They made swans and geese and brant. Um, um, one thing, I, um, it seems like if you have a decoy that has a repair, but it's a good original repair, yeah. you know, there, there's so much bias against repairs. Right. Well, it, I mean, opportunity to have some really fine decoys. Sure. 
I, I mean, I, I have stuff that has repairs because, you know, it's sort of the same thing. It's supply and demand. The world record decoy, the tip of the bill's fixed because there's only three hens known. Two are in private museums, and this one needed the tip of the bill, <laughs> you know? So they, they replaced it because where else are you going to get one? Um, uh, there are some swans by a guy named John Williams from uh, North Carolina, and none of them are in the original paint. They're all repainted, but they're important, and a lot of early collectors owned them and believed they were very important. So there are collectors today who spend crazy amounts of money, but they only spend on really good original condition decoys. Well, one of them actually finally broke the mold and bought a John Williams swan because he wanted to have an important swan and there aren't any others, there aren't, aren't any known in original paint. So he figured, you know, it's the best that I can own for a John Williams swan. So I, you know, he bought it. Um, so yeah, some with repairs, some actually, some repairs, I think, Increase the the. Yeah, that's that's certainly. Yeah, there's a there's a Nathan Cobb, curlew, Eskimo curlew, and it they use it almost looks like a guitar string, you know, wrapped around real tight on the bill because and it's the original bill but it was cracked, uh, and they just repaired it and they used it after that and it's still like that and uh, I think it sort of adds to the. The history of it and the the look. But. You know, if and it all depends on the sort of the extent of the of the repair. If it's got a completely new head, it's it's going to go down quite a bit in value. Pretty much original paint uh, to repaint, it's you're going down like seventy five percent of the value. Are most high end collectors from the United States? And yeah. Where are most? Where, what is the spread of uh, countries where yep. collectors are? I mean, we, we have, there are a couple high-end or, or real serious collectors in, uh, there's in England, Belgium. Um, there were some in Germany and Switzerland, but not really anymore. Uh, for the most part, U.S. and Canada, and that's it. Um, uh, some that are in England are expats that just live there and still collect. Um, and some, um, some are, one's this well-known famous sculptor from England, uh, and he, he sees them as sculpture, uh, and he has a very beautiful collection. They've been cl collecting a long time. For the most part, it's, it's Americans. A lot of them were hunters at one point, or even if they weren't serious sportsmen, they at least went hunting, say, with their parents and, or with their fathers and uncles when they were younger, and it reminds them of, them of that time. And they're hedge fund managers, <laughs> and they have a you know, $30 million property, and they want to decorate it with some sporting items. Um, or you know, a lot of doctors, a lot of farmers, I mean, people from all over the place. And you know, when it, you come to one of the auctions or one of the shows, you know, everybody's on the same level. Everybody loves the decoys, and um, it's it's really neat. How often do you see those puck guns come around? Every once in a while. I mean, they are rare. There are people that collect. You know, mostly they're they're generally gun collectors that collect punt guns. But some uh, decoy collectors that are doing, say, a decoy room or a sports sporting room, they'll you know, 13, 16 foot long gun hanging there. It's pretty impressive. We shipped one to Washington State freight, a 13 footer, uh, you know, and it's $1,500 just to ship it there. But, you know, where else are you going to get one? They're all sort of handmade, outlaw made, you know, pre-1920. So they're definitely a piece of American history. They bring, the last one we sold, I think was 13 or 14,000. And there are different kinds. I mean, there are smaller ones with multiple, <laughs> sort of like a, a crude Tommy gun or something, uh, and others were just huge. They did use those in England. Uh, that's uh, and actually some English companies manufactured. They weren't quite that big. They were, they were um, maybe eight, ten feet long. Uh, but the American ones that are handmade are the the real collectible ones. For the most part, in, in, in the reason the wooden decoys are uniquely North American is, again, the way they hunted in, in England and in France and stuff. They mostly used nets or they didn't use decoys at all. Um, actually, the, 
I think the term decoy comes from some root of you know the the actual um, nets that they used to to lure the they used uh, they would set up a net, let the birds land, and then sort of spook them into the nets, and uh, that's how they hunted. Is that how we there are passenger pigeon decoys. There are pigeon decoys, passenger pigeon decoys. Uh, so I'm not sure. I'm assuming they had. There were such big flocks. They must have used rather than waste the ammo. They and it must have been so easy. They probably just set up nets, which is horrible. But so how would the net be used? Raised off the ground a little bit, or was it tangling your feet, or what's uh, I think the way that they used them in Europe was it was almost like a tunnel, and it was set up where you were at the opening of the tunnel, so you didn't necessarily see the net. Uh, and it flew in, went after flying into the entrance of the net, uh, you know, it's essentially went into nothing and they just closed up the opening of the net. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you guys are lucky to be living here. I mean, there weren't any really well-known prolific makers that are real sought after, but it's some of the only really great freshwater uh, Sporting historically in Maine, most of the hunting was done in, you know, in the ocean. But uh, I know a lot of people still love to hunt here. Well, we did have the decoy shop down the street. Exactly. Yep. I've I've had some of those. <laughs> the mache decoys. What time frame would you be talking about? Uh, actually, some of them I think are pretty early. I think they, some of the companies were in the forties. And I say that I just bought a shorebird. It was pre nineteen eighteen, pre shorebird outlawed. So it's they were making them in nineteen hundred. But this was a shorebird. You know, it's a it's a yellow leg uh, with. I'm actually not sure if there's any frame in it or how they made the actual. Uh, there are canvas decoys that are some are the ones from North Carolina are wire frame. The ones from Massachusetts are are wood frame, but stretched canvas over it. Um, the mache decoys, the ducks are just sort of a pressed mold, but those shorebirds, I think there must be some type of little frame in there. Not sure. I'm not about to cut it mine open either. But <laughs> Jester was alive 1896 to 1961, I think, but that's earlier, probably late 20s, for him. Chickatee, Virginia. Most of his crests are are carved crests, you know, the f like four prongs. So that's why it's, you know, it makes you look at it twice. He did carve hooded mergansers with a, a, just a regular straight crest. But uh, if you didn't get one of our catalogs, I do have some more. Welcome to have them. And the the books over here, the Art of Deception, that was a one of our really good customers. Um, since the early 90s, he built this fabulous, fabulous collection, um, and he exhibited it in uh, Memphis. And we did the, we packed up all his collection, moved it down there, did a, a big um, exhibit. Uh, they raised a lot of money for the museum, and, and uh, I think it was Ducks Unlimited or Delta Waterfowl or something. Uh, but you're welcome to those two. Some of the most expensive decoys known. Is that early, early call it evening? Sure. Yeah. Another uh, item upstairs. Can I go get it? Close the oh, cards. Close your eyes. <laughs> there we go. Shuffle the cards. Yeah. Dave Boyle. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <don't> <laughs> yeah, we do, I should plug my, our company I work for, we do three auctions a year, um, decoys from all over the country in Canada, some duck calls, this is the new world record for a duck call. We sold it in July for 103000 for a quack quack wooden duck call. Pretty, what pretty special about that one? Uh, there's four known. It's a by by one of the godfathers, originators of the modern day duck call, um, and it was presented to the game commissioner of the state of I think it was Indiana or wherever the guy lived. Um, you know, carved panels. There's very very rare. 
uh, one of the most sought after duck call makers, uh, one of four that he spent this much time and effort. There's a coiled snake around the, 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 the reed. There's all kinds of different carving in it. And the guy who won it, uh, he owns two of the other ones. And before, he, before the auction, he had it photographed for the cover of his book that he's doing on his collection. So he wasn't going home without it. Yeah. Online yep, on yep. Fish mm -hmm. um, can I email you a picture of it? Absolutely. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. Yep. Yeah. My email should be, it's in the catalog, the front of the catalog. Okay. It's in 